Abbas. One thing you said, which is very important, is that the canons of the church are spiritually applied immediately. Uh, their administrative application is a, another story. They may never be applied administratively. That changes nothing. Immediately means instantaneously. Anyone who can discover this. Look, this isn't theory. I tell you something simply that you can try experimentally. I tell you, I'll tell you this. I used to say this to my students. Let's suppose that you are in a very good spiritual state. Uh, allow, permit, a blasphemous or evil thought to enter your heart. As soon as you have permitted it, consented to it, then again examine yourself. Examine yourself and see what's happening to you. You have nothing to do with God. The previous state has ceased to exist. In reverse, in reverse, repent for whatever you are aware of doing, deeply, existentially. Orient yourself toward Christ and say, My Christ, I repent wholeheartedly for these things and do not wish to repeat them in any case. Do not wish to repeat them. I want to listen to you and live for you. If you do not receive a down payment of remission immediately in full consciousness, watch the words I'm using. They aren't mine. They are St. Simeon, the new theologian's words. He says that if you do not feel this after repenting, before you even go to confession, well, now the next question is, if spiritually this happens immediately, why do we have to go to confession? I, I shall respond to this afterwards. I'm speaking now of the down payment. Stay with me. He says, then if you do not see this thing in full consciousness, that is, feel it in your soul and in your body, then may I forfeit my salvation. May I forfeit my salvation? Look, look at that. He named the most precious thing he could. 998 years have passed since the repose of St. Simeon, the new theologian. That is almost a thousand years. Almost a thousand years. For a thousand years, the church has been celebrating him as a saint and a great theologian. That means in practice that he was not proven wrong. That whoever does this will most certainly receive the down payment. Because if he did not receive it, St. Simeon the New Theologian should have ceased being a saint. You'll tell me, is there no possibility of one not feeling this? Of the saint being proven wrong? Yes, there is. It is when a man thinks that he has repented and then confessed, but he did not repent. He regretted. He just had remorse. That is, he reveals that he made a mistake, like Judas, like Judas, and not like Peter. Not like Peter, who cried bitterly. Now, you have brought up the question of the down payment with reference to complete remission and asked why should one then go to confession? It is entirely necessary for one to go to confession because Christ gave this power of binding and loosing entirely to the apostles and through the apostles of the bishops and priests. This means that because we are baptized, we have become a royal priesthood. The book of Revelation says this. St. Peter the Apostle also says this in his epistles. We have a general kind of priesthood. What, what, is this, what does this mean? We can participate in the mysteries, not celebrate the mysteries, participate in the mysteries. A special gift is needed in order to bind and loose, and this is of the apostles, bishops, and priests. But the ability, the ability of participation is given by the power of this priesthood. And the basic thing is that we can defeat thoughts. We can defeat the thoughts. We have the spiritual power within us, within ourselves, by our baptism and holy chrismation, to defeat thoughts. Thoughts. And every high thing which lifts itself up against the knowledge of God, according to St. Paul. St. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians. Now, I come to the mystery of repentance, which is different from the mystery of confession. Repentance is the existential turn, the existential turn towards God and our persistent concentration on Him alone as much as possible. This is evident in prayer. That is, we are in repentance when during prayer our noose does not travel around when it is focused on God on the whole and whenever it does not depart.
we bring it back. Whenever it does depart, we bring it back, repenting that it isn't where it should be continually because the new should be continually working. Christ told us, he said, my father worketh until now and I work. He called us to be working. The work performed by the noose, which is worthy of the supreme worth, the noose has in man, since the noose is the governor, the peak. This work is prayer. And let no one say, if I'm praying, how can I take care of worldly cares? When a man is praying, then it is he becomes brilliant because he sees things in a spiritual way. He puts them in the right priority swiftly and makes the right decision. We think that by making our news independent of God and bringing it down into our mind, that is, by reckoning purely with our logic on the basis of the available data, we see experientially that we make a mistake, sometimes very many mistakes, because there is one thing we didn't consider. The spiritual man, however, does not make mistakes. Not because he's infallible, but because the spirit that possesses him, that lives within him, governs him, is the spirit of God himself. So, even from the viewpoint of being spiritually bright, smart, it is our best interest to be in repentance. This regards repentance. This is what continual repentance means, not our occasional report of some sin. Right? Not just some sin. You said earlier that repentance is only a turn. No, not only a turn. It is the existential turn as a first movement and a permanent movement, if I may say so. Right? I call it a turn because experientially our news slips away and we have to bring it back. Beyond that, the process of repentance contains what is called self-visitation, which is when we pray that the Holy Spirit enlighten us, that is, enlighten our darkness, so that we may see what is happening to us. This is self-visitation. During self-visitation, we realize what is happening within us. And then we come to our self-diagnosis. That's what the prodigal did, right? He came to himself. Precisely, he came to himself, visited himself, saw his pitiful state, and thought what he had with his father. So it, it was the beginning of repentance, not the end. Precisely. It is the beginning of repentance, but it also has procedures. It has, so, in other words, if after, after we have critiqued ourselves and seen what state we're in, then repentance is more evidently born. Right? He said, I shall go to my father. But from the moment he said it until he actually came and went to his father, it was a whole trip, right? Which St. John Chrysostom analyzes very well. Let our, let our audience read the pertinent passage. It says, he went to his father, then it says he decided to go to his father, and then it says, he went to his father, but while he was on the way, his father was, out, was outside. Right? He was on his way, his father was outside. As St. John Chrysostom interprets, in his disposition, he decided to go to his father, but it's not easy to go. The evil one had power over him, and as we said earlier, because the prodigal son had been doing his will. So the evil one had him in bonds. Right? When a man becomes a slave of sin, just because he made a good decision doesn't mean that he'll realize the decision. Right? First of all, he has to battle with the demonic powers. Let's remember this in our conversation, because after repentance, the first thing we need to seek is for these powers to be immobilized. If they are not immobilized, it's the evil one who's occupying certain spaces spaces within us by our passions does not come out, we shall not be able to do anything, right? We shall be swinging back and forth, back and forth. Yeah. So the first thing we must do immediately, which can only happen in the mysteries, is that we must go to confession, because it is written, when he went to his father, the father embraced him and kissed him. What does that mean? He accepted the man that repented. So we repent, we go there. For communion to be restored, we have to publicize these things because publicity extinguishes the evil one and ridicules him, right? And then, in this sincere confession, which is a different mystery, that is, when we have not only considered and decided it internally, but also confessed, 
then we receive this entirety of remission, right? This entirety of remission. I want to comment on the down payment a bit more, but uh, because they are, uh, they are of such great importance, we cannot go to our confessor very often, but we can repent and receive the down payment and so be free, relatively free, of the evil one in our decisions and actions. But to conclude, I would like to say that even this sincere confession does not absolutely guard, safeguard the remission that we received as a gift under our communion with God. Right? It is not absolutely safeguard. Only divine communion secures this. Only when we eat and drink, he says, only when you eat and drink me will you have life, said Christ. We have received remission. But what is remission? It's healing. Simply being healthy is not the goal. From a Christian standpoint, from a Christian viewpoint in the church, you must also have secured that life, which is not static, but always increasing according to your disposition. So, this whole process reaches its culmination in your blameless participation in the mystery of life, which is participation in divine communion. Blameless participation in divine communion. So remission clearly clears away obstacles, but only that. It's not life. We need to have communion. Man must have communion. Remission is the healing. Look, it's the healing. It is as if the sick man went, received some medicine, had a surgery, and his health was restored. Right? This is... He isn't sick. Let's put it in the negative. He isn't, he isn't sick. All right? But the healthy man is ever at risk of falling ill. The goal is not being just healthy. He must have some sort of activity, some positive stance towards life, some development, some creativity. This is a kind of nourishment, right? All right, the child is healthy. But if he is hungry, it's the same with adults. I'm hungry, but I don't receive the fuel, so to speak. I don't receive the strength. I cannot have the creativity that gives worth to my existence as a man. In our homes, it's not enough for us to be healthy because the Lord brought abundant life, not only biological existence. Now we are speaking of the life that is of an uncreated character, since we are receiving the divinity within us by grace. Now, let me only mention one more very important point about the down payment. Can we return in a little bit to our current situation so as to connect this beautiful spiritual discourse with the handling of this current crisis? Yes, yes, look, without the substructure that I have spoke of, whatever else we would have said would have remained incoherent and suspended in air. So, here I shall conclude with this, saying that the importance of continual repentance gives us the ability of being freed from the powers of the evil one because we are continually in humility. Since we acquire humility by repenting, and as St. Paisus would say, there's no exception in the spiritual law of humility. Quote, God giveth grace to the humble, according to St. James. When we receive this grace on the level of the down payment by repentance alone, we have a certain liberty of proper spiritual movement. Right? This is not absolute. But we, we, then we say, glory to God, we live by these down payments. Right? I'm saying this in connection with the present situation that we're living in. The churches are closed. We aren't receiving life within us since we aren't communing. Right? It's very serious, very serious. Nor can we even go to confession. But we can have remission of sins in the form of down payments. Right? By experience, we realize that not everything is black within us. Of course, we know that this is only the beginning of healing, but still we are not dying because we are repenting.